Chapter 23, Global Climate Change. So I know a lot of people were interested in global climate change, um, and this kind of rolls into sustainability and kind of wrapping up our whole unit one. Um, so we'll start with talking about what climate actually is. I noticed I did forget to put what your learning objectives were, but essentially by the end of this chapter, you really should know um, ways that changing temperatures and changing I climate are impacting ecosystems, what the greenhouse effect is, and what does it have to do with global warming and climate change in general, as well as what the carbon cycle is. So we'll start off with what climate is, right? What's the difference between climate and weather? And it's been said before, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. So weather is more local. It's local atmospheric conditions over a very short interval Whereas climate is a long interval, so it's over decades, usually over 30 years, but at least over decades. Um, and so you start to see temperature and precipitation patterns with it. Um, for instance, if you go to the desert, you know that you're going to a dry climate. And then it could change seasonally where it could be either a cold or a hot climate as well. Um, but weather is daily temperature and precipitation activity. So whether you wake up today and it's rainy um, and whether we have trade winds and, you know, all of that is daily weather. Okay, so this is an infographic from your book. Again, weather is the short term, climate is the long term, um, and usually over a larger region as well and not just talking about one city or one smaller geographic area. Okay. Um, and the reason why we want to differentiate this is we do have different weather patterns and they tend to be focused a little bit on what our climate patterns actually are, right? Um, so we can have yearly or longer averages of temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, currents, moisture, whatever it is. Um, and that all goes into saying what that climate actually is versus what's happening on a shorter term um, with the weather. And weather can be changing over time as well, just like climates can. Okay. So again, just to kind of illustrate it, this is the temperature um, in Bethlehem over September. So again, we're looking at a 30-day interval here, and you can see how variable the temperature is. And these dots are the the average daily temperature and you can see how much the monthly average temperature can range that's this air bar right here essentially okay so quite a bit of range with the weather um and then we look at the monthly weather right for let's say philadelphia and we can look at the temperature here versus precipitation and we can get kind of an average of what the weather looks like when we're looking at climate now we're going to look at a much longer scale so now we're looking at um, Allentown, Pennsylvania, we're looking at the temperature um, as it's ranged throughout the years, going all the way from 1950 to pretty much today, okay? And so you can see it's, it's up and down, it's all over the place, and sometimes what's really helpful with graphs, and you'll find this out, uh, if not in this class, in some other classes as well, but sometimes it's really helpful to add a trend line, right? So this is taking an average of data across time, and we can look at the trend and say, okay, clearly it's positively increasing over time. Maybe not significantly, we'd have to run some data um, analysis to discover if that's significant or not, but we can see that it is positively increasing over time, even though it still has a lot of variability, the general trend is increasing. So what kind of factors influence climate? Um, there's a whole lot of things that go into climate, right? It's regulated through very complex interactions among the sun, earth, ocean, and the atmosphere. But essentially what's happening um, is energy is absorbed by the sun and it's trapped by gases in the atmosphere, which we'll go over here in just a second. Um, but because of the sun's dominant influence on the planet, we expect the climate to vary both regionally, right? We, we went over last chapter how the sun, um, the sun's angles hitting the earth affects uh, like what biomes we have characterized and what the vegetation is based on precipitation and temperature. Same thing here. That's we're we're looking at different biomes across the earth, but those are essentially all in different climates, right? And those are varying both regionally as well as seasonally. So the sun um, is obviously changing with the seasons too. So we have some differences in climate with the seasons as well. 
So when we're talking about climate change, it's a significant change in the measures of climate lasting, again, for an extended period of time. <clears throat> so we're looking at decades and more, okay? So this is major changes in temperature, precipitation, wind patterns, lots of other things that are happening over several decades or longer. And that's what climate change is. I have this video here. Um, I'm not gonna play it for you in this, just to try to keep this a little bit shorter, but I am going to recommend that you watch the video. It is on La Lima, so you'll see it. It's uh, called Causes and Effects of Climate Change, I believe. But please do watch it. I think this one's only like three minutes long. Um, <clears throat> you will see a few other videos that I refer to in this uh, uh, presentation, and those are all likely and, or it's possible, but also likely that you will see questions from these videos on the exam. So please do take a look at them. I think it's also really helpful to watch these videos. And there are also good videos on your ebook as well, doing little animations for something like, say, the carbon cycle. Oh, it's going to play in the So as we talk about climate change, we, we start getting into something called phenology. And this is just the study of cyclic life events. So this is kind of the rhythms of nature, um, plant flowering, animal migration, lots of different things that are influenced by climate and seasonal changes. And with a changing climate, we run into the issue of we don't know exactly how the climate is changing necessarily. Um, in some ways we do in some areas, but we don't also know how quickly that's gonna happen. And that makes it really difficult to predict some of the ecosystem effects that are happening. So if flowers are blooming earlier or later, or animals are coming out of hibernation sooner, whatever it is, it might not necessarily seem like a big deal, but because everything is so well adapted to their environment, it can be a really big deal. Um, and it, it links up to so many more things, right? Um, in the example here that's taken from your book, you can see the rate of temperature change over over the years. And basically blue, it's getting colder, red, it's getting warmer. So you can see, for the most part, we're getting warmer everywhere, right? And there's a few places here, kind of Midwest, South, um, that are getting cooler. And you can see how this correlates to the change in first bloom. So again, earlier, dates are more orange, later are more blue, and you can see this correlates pretty well with temperature. So as the temperature is getting warmer, we're also having flowers bloom earlier. As the temperature is uh, decreasing, we're having later bloom dates. So why is this significant? Who cares about bloom dates? Well, a lot of species do, right? Um, this is one of the examples in your book, and I think it's a pretty powerful example, um, is the the relationship between roe deer and uh, flowering in springtime. So roe deer are having their offspring basically to, timing it to a day, whereas these flowers are not timing their flowering date to a day. They're timing it to temperatures, right? So as the temperature is going up, these flowering dates are coming earlier, but the deer is still giving birth at the same time that they always were. So we're now getting this mismatch between when the deer are born and when there's actual food availability. So their survivability is decreasing over time because when they're being born, there's not as much food available and it's going quicker and they're going through that season a little bit faster than they would have normally. So this is an issue for not just these species, um, but, but lots of other species that are really relying on these different rhythms that are cued by you know, whether it's temperature or snow melt, um, so, you know, some of them are daylight hours, they're very seasonal, but it, it really depends on what the relationship is and how these things are happening. So this is, this is one example of the kind of issue that we're facing and how it's really difficult to know when that's gonna happen. We, we know generally that most, most climates um, overall are, increasing in temperature, but there are, like you saw, some that are decreasing, and we don't really know the rate. We can guess the rate, we can model the rate, we have lots of models coming out for climate change, but those are all ba based on our best guess, and they're based on science, which, as you know, science can change every day. So it, we're, we're really just doing the best that we can to model these things and hope that we kind of understand what those ecosystem effects are, but really, with the more cli the climate is changing, the more we really don't know.
And we saw a lot of that during this pandemic, even, right? Um, it, your book even mentions the um, Australian fires that were in 2019. I guess it was 2019, that kind of pre-pandemic, and then we went into the pandemic. So, uh, but lots of different things that are happening and that really can mean really widespread ecosystem change. Uh, here's another example that your book has of these bark beetles in the trees. So these bark beetles are feeding on these trees and basically they were kept in check before because of freezing winter temperatures that would kill them off. But with increased temperatures, there, we're, have, we're seeing more and more of these beetles, right? And the trees did develop um, sort of a predatory, or sorry, not predatory, uh, effective defense mechanism, essentially. And they would release more sap to kind of block the beetles. But because we're seeing an increase in temperature, we're seeing a decrease in precipitation, we're seeing really areas of severe, severe drought. And because of this drought, the trees don't really have the energy or the resources to produce that sap. So they're not really able to defend themselves in any way. And there's significantly more bark beetles um, in place now because of these increasing temperatures. We're not seeing them die off um, from the winter. So we're seeing lots and lots of trees die from mass infestation. Uh, the warming has also allowed them to move further north. So we're getting lots of really big insect populations and they're not necessarily good for the environment. And this is also leading to obviously larger fires um, we've seen quite a few fires, and I think we're seeing quite a quite a big increase in the number, the size, and the severity of a lot of these forest fires. And um, this is kind of what I say when this class isn't meant to be political, but it ends up um, getting into some politics, especially when you talk about climate change. Climate change shouldn't be political. Um, obviously, it is because it involves a lot of money, right? Um, we have people that are protecting interests and don't want to acknowledge it. And we have people uh, that don't want to spend the money doing things that could hopefully help slow it down or prevent climate change to some extent. But similar with forest fires, um, I think especially in the last few years, we've seen it become even more politicized in, in the context of climate change. And, you know, you have people on the left that are arguing it's just climate change and people on the right that are arguing it's forest mismanagement. And, and obviously that's not black and white. You have people all over the board. Um, but I would encourage you to look at both sides of that because I think that forest mismanagement is definitely something that is happening at, um, in the U.S. as well as all over the world. We aren't doing controlled burns the way that we should be. We're not, we're not doing what we can to manage these forests in the best way possible. On the flip side of that, we wouldn't need quite as much management if we were able to slow climate change or if climate change wasn't happening, especially at the rate it's happening. So I, uh, with a lot of things in class, I really encourage you to not see it as it is politicized, but to hopefully see both sides of the coin, um, because I think that there's something to both sides of it, especially in this case with forest fires. Um, but the overall the overarching theme of it really is climate change. With increased temperatures, we're seeing more droughts, more severe droughts as well. And with a difference in species that are prevalent, um, it's really all just kind of leading to igniting that fire, so to speak. So when we're talking about climate change, um, and sorry, I'll, I'll just kind of go back to that with, with like the bark beetles, we see some of these animals that are, you know, for bark beetles, climate change is rel relatively good, right? They're, they're not dying off in the winter, they're, they're living longer, and that's great for bark beetles, um, but it's not necessarily good for all species. So there is a video at the end of this, um, I think it's just titled, Can Animals Adapt to Climate Change? And there are obviously some species that will fare really well and some that will not. And there's also gonna be a greater competition between these two for that. So. Keep that in mind as you're going through this and thinking about some of these species that, you know, are kind of taking over. But shifting a little bit now, so we've talked about what climate is, how it is influenced, um, you know, how we get different climates and what we're really looking at. And one of the overarching themes behind it is the greenhouse effect. So you've probably heard of greenhouse gases. You've probably heard of the greenhouse effect, but the greenhouse effect is a natural process. It is technically a good thing. 
right? We we have to have the greenhouse effect um, because otherwise the earth would be freezing. It would be way too cold for anyone or any species to live on. Um, so we do need it. It is natural because otherwise it would be at least zero degrees. Um, but what the greenhouse effect is, is that earth or heat is radiated from earth's surface. So you have the sun energy here. It's entering earth's atmosphere and heating up the earth's surface right? And it's being trapped by a lot of the greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases are like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. Uh, there's quite a few different greenhouse gases, but the main ones you probably hear about are carbon dioxide and methane, which are the ones that will hit a little bit harder in this lecture as well. And those are key to sustaining life on Earth, right? Um, some of that heat is re-radiated or uh, reflected back off as light and heat from the sun's surface and it leaves the atmosphere, but quite a bit of it is still trapped in here by those gases, okay? Enhanced greenhouse effect is the increased amount of greenhouse gases, and that's what is leading to an increased global temperature. Okay, so just another um, example or another diagram, I guess, of the greenhouse gases. So again, we have the sunlight coming in and again, some of it's absorbed, some of it's reflected, but for the most part, we're keeping most of it within the atmosphere because of these greenhouse gases. And again, a natural process, a good thing for, to some extent, but the enhanced greenhouse effect, the um, increase of these greenhouse gases is not good. Okay, um, again, primary greenhouse gases, they're being absorbed um, into the atmosphere. They are naturally and anthropogenically produced, anthropogenically meaning human, right? Um, again, the main ones we'll talk about here are carbon dioxide and methane, but there are quite a few others. Ozone, we hear about the ozone layer all the time. Um, and if we're getting a hole in the ozone, whatever. But these do come naturally, so like volcanic eruptions, um, lots, lots of different things like that, but they are also being produced at a much more alarming rate because of humans, right? So burning fossil fuels, power plants, using cars, um, deforestation, these slash and burn practices that we use in forests and to get wood and other resources, agriculture and industrial practices, as well as livestock production. Um, and other human activities are really leading to a huge increase in greenhouse gases. So just to touch on this really quick, I know you've all probably heard of global warming as well. So why are we saying climate change instead of global warming? Uh, global warming is specific, right? It is, it is referring specifically to recent and ongoing rise in global average temperature, okay? It is caused mostly by increasing greenhouse gases and it is causing different climate patterns to change. But it's only one small piece of the puzzle, right? This is one aspect of climate change. It's not the whole story. Um, and it has been marketed arguably kind of the wrong way by some of these guys that were first trying to get it out and say like, well, in our generation, that were first trying to get it out and say, global warming is bad, it's bad. And then you have people that are having really severe winter storms that are like, what global warming? Um, understand that is still part of climate change. Global warming is just one aspect of it, and that is something that is going to have catastrophic effects, but climate change is much bigger than just global warming. <clears throat> so when we're talking about this, we're talking about increased gases, uh, greenhouse gases. Why are we getting increased greenhouse gases? What's the real issue here? Where is it coming from? Well, we're, we're talking a lot about carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide obviously has carbon in it. So it's only logical that we need to know a little bit about the carbon cycle. Carbon cycle, just like we talked about the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle, is basically just the way that carbon moves um, between organic and inorganic states um, in the environment, okay? Um, or sorry, it, organic and inorganic molecules in the environment, but it is also moving between different states. Okay. So like other chemical elements that are on Earth, carbon, the amount of carbon on Earth stays the same, right? If we burn carbon dioxide, if we burn a fossil fuel, it's not changing the amount that's on this Earth. It's staying the same. The problem is, is that fossil fuels are down here, right? Fossil fuels are down below the Earth's surface. 
These have been compressed over millions of years, so organic molecules like um, uh, that are basically trapped under the seas or in between the Earth's surface. That's why we're drilling for oil. And that's how we get things like coal, oil, natural gas. And the reason why it's a problem that we're using these and why we're drilling for them and bringing them up is these were effectively locked out of our carbon cycle. So they've always existed. It's not like we're bringing something new into existence, but instead of it just being kind of stored away and, you know, sort of out of sight, out of mind, now what we're doing is we're bringing it up here and then we're using it for different things, right? So we're using it for um, to fuel our vehicles. We're using it to for electricity. We're, we're using it for all sorts of different things. And when we do that, now we're burning it, right? We're, we're effectively burning it. And so we're getting tons and tons of CO2 that's um, going out into the atmosphere and really increasing that greenhouse gas. And we have a whole carbon cycle, right? So Again, we've got carbon that's entering soil via organic matter as well. And then some of that gets compressed over millions or hundreds of thousands of years, and it's locked in here as fossil fuels. But some of it's a little bit more readily available. Um, with oceanic respiration and photosynthesis, which we'll go over photosynthesis in a few chapters here, but with um, respiration and photosynthesis, you're basically going back and forth, right? The photosynthesis uses CO2 and outputs O2. So that's why in this equation here, we've got CO2 that's being produced from natural processes, which is happening, um, like volcanic eruptions and things like that. But then we also have it produced from human activity, like burning these fossil fuels, deforestation, uh, respiration, when we're breathing out, we're exhaling CO2, right? And we've got quite a few people on this planet, so that's a decent amount, although it's not something that's unsustainable necessarily. And then we're subtracting the CO2 that is removed through photosynthesis. So the more trees we have, the more we're able to subtract, basically. Um, and the same thing is happening, our, our greatest resource is really the ocean. Um, which is why we don't want the sea levels to drop. We don't want the sea, uh, the ocean to become acidic because this is helping quite a great deal with removing CO2, okay? So all of that, you get the net CO2 released into the atmosphere each year. Um, these are just kind of arbitrary numbers um, here. You don't really need to worry about those, but understand where the CO2 is coming from and how it's going through this carbon cycle and back into the atmosphere. And again, as atmospheric CO2, it's not necessarily bioavailable. It's not something that a, a lot of things can use. You have to turn it into something else, which we'll talk about more next unit. Um, but it, it does go through different phases and different processes. But the, the big problem is pulling out fossil fuels and now introducing them into this cycle. Here's just another diagram. Um, you guys can kind of look it over and understand a little bit more about what's happening. I won't focus on it too much here because it's essentially the same thing. Um, it's just showing you the carbon cycle and different ways that we can introduce carbon into the atmosphere. So when we're talking about carbon dioxide concentrations, we're looking at the highest we've seen in 800,000 years. So you might be like, all right, how do we know what the heck happened 800,000 years ago? Well, excellent question. Um, and the way that we've measured historical carbon dioxide levels is actually through glacial ice cores. And it's a really cool process. Um, but basically, these little gas bubbles that are trapped in these ice cores can be analyzed for their carbon dioxide levels. So we can understand what time frame these came from and what carbon dioxide was. And you can see we've had huge variability in CO2 concentration. So climate change is absolutely something that is natural and will happen. The problem is, is that we are seeing much higher levels than we have ever recorded. And the rate of increase is unprecedented. Okay, um, <clears throat> now we're just taking direct measurements of CO2 from the atmosphere. We actually, one of the, the best measurements that we have is from Mauna Loa um, on Big Island in Hawaii. So. We, this is one of the, the main ones that's used by everyone in the world, actually, for measuring CO2. But you can see here's the 2019 average. It's above 400 parts per million. 
historically, before we hit the Industrial Revolution, when we figured out, like, hey, we can build all this stuff and we can make it bigger and better and do all these things that make traveling easier, et cetera, we had never gone above 300 parts per million. Now we're above 400 parts per million. So it is, uh, in science, it is not disputed that humans are changing the planet um, and that, you know, whether that's a good or bad thing maybe could be disputed, um, although I think you're mostly seeing negative effects. But definitely w we've never seen it rise above this. So even with the variability, even when we've gone through ice ages, we've never seen it go quite like this. And there's no sign of it stopping. It's been, on average, increasing at a crazy rate every year. So you always, you know, you always hear a debate about whether humans are responsible or not. And again, it, seeing that we've never seen this kind of of increase, uh, if you're looking at just that this has all happened since the Industrial Revolution, even since 1950, right? 1950, we were around 320 parts per million um, CO2 in the atmosphere. And now again, this is actually old. We're still above 400 here. I think we're closer to like 420, 430. So the amount that this is increasing from 1950 is just insane. So if people want to argue with you about it's it's natural and it's not human caused, I the science clearly points to it. It, it is right. Um, Temperatures are much higher now as they've been increasing with carbon dioxide um, concentration as well. And the difference from the 20th century, you can see over here, but it's even going from 1880 to 2020. And just imagining how many things we've invented and how much more we're using over this time frame is pretty crazy. Okay. So when we're talking about this, um, too, you've probably heard about a carbon footprint, or sometimes it's called an ecological footprint, and you guys will be doing this in your class activity, is calculating out your own carbon footprint um, or ecological footprint. And that's just, for you, it's a little bit different. For this, a carbon footprint is measuring the total greenhouse gases produced by human activities. So things like burning from fossil fuel, uh, rice and cattle, Rice is actually one of the biggest methane producers, and so is cattle. And it sounds it sounds kind of stupid, right? But basically from cow farts, that's where we're getting tons and tons of methane. Um, and it's estimated to be, I think your book says, 100 million tons of methane a year to the atmosphere. So that's a lot of methane. And that's one of the reasons why going vegetarian is one of the best things you can do um, to be a little bit more sustainable, or at least cutting out meat as much as you can. But Deforestation and concrete production are also huge. Um, this is an older graph. This is one that comes from your book, but you can see global greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector. So electricity is pretty big, 25%. Transportation, 14%. Industry, 21%. Um, so we've got, you know, different levels, and it's changed a little bit from a few years ago, but roughly you still see very similar very similar trends here. Okay. Um, and this is when you get into arguments about should we use renewable energy or non-renewable energy. And non-renewable energy is things like petroleum, natural gas, coal, all of our fossil fuels. Those aren't renewable. Once we use them, they're gone. Is the CO2 gone or the carbon? No, the carbon still exists, right? And now we've, we've released it as a atmospheric gas and that's the issue but we're not able to recapture that and turn it back into petroleum or natural gas or coal. So that's a problem. Um, it's damaging a lot of local habitats too, as well as water resources. You've seen a lot of that from where we're drilling. Um, it's producing more greenhouse gases, polluting the environment. So why do we still do it? Well, because it's super cheap, right? Relatively. Um, and the whole world is wrapped up in oil. Um, that's where all the money is, and it's a very abundant energy source. We still have quite a bit left, but just because we have it left doesn't mean that you want to use it. And it's non-renewable in terms of once you've used it, you can't use it again, but also once you run out, there's no going back. Um, and we've got quite a bit until we run out, I believe, but 
that's not necessarily a good thing, right? I think we'll probably run into much bigger issues before we run out of fossil fuels necessarily. So that's why everyone, well, hopefully everyone is hoping to turn to renewable energy um, because it's something that's not depleted. So this is something like solar, wind power, um, ocean technologies, if we're harnessing energy from waves, that kind of stuff is renewable. That kind of stuff is not going to go away, right? Um, and it's not released into the atmosphere. It's already something that's here. We have geothermal as well, like if we're harnessing um, from geothermal events, like on Big Island or wherever there's other pretty major volcanic or geothermal activity. Um, there's lots of different ways. There's also biomass. These are all renewable sources. Why aren't we using them? Well, they're a lot more expensive than over here, right? Um, they're also really, uh, the technology that we need to harness that energy isn't super available and it's not necessarily the best yet. So that, that is the future and I'm hoping that's where we're moving more towards, but it's definitely an expensive step and it's something that's really hard to convince everyone to get on board with um, you know, essentially going for the greater good versus what's good right now. Okay, so how much time do we have left? When is climate change arriving? Uh, there's lots of different predictions. And again, this is just te temperature raising. And as the temperature is rising, it, there's lots of different issues. But there are some papers that will predict as early as 2029 for a year of climate departure. And that doesn't mean the world's coming to an end then, but that means basically that there's not any reversal to it. Um, that's when the climate is going to completely change and it's not going to be reversible. There are some models that predict out much further, but a lot of them are, are soon. They're within the next like 20 years. And that's something pretty significant for us. Um, again, year of climate departure, it really depends. It's happening a lot quicker in places like the Arctic, um, which we'll talk about in a second, but the climate departure isn't necessarily going to happen as quick there. What about climate change in Hawaii? Why does it matter here? You'll see this little graphic here of sea level rise over the next, um, I think it's, mm, I don't know why I'm not remembering what the sea level rise is, is looking like. I think this is by 2100 um, with a rise in only only three feet, right? Um, and this has to do with a lot of different things with increasing temperature like sea, sea caps um, or ice, sea ice melting. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But just with it warming up, even only up to five or six or seven degrees Fahrenheit, we've got significant level sea rise. And you can see that this is taking over not just Waikiki, right? This is Alawai. We're starting to get back even further. We're starting to go into Makiki and beyond. Um, so this is a problem economically and, you know, for a lot of people. Um, ocean acidification is also increasing, which is threatening corals. And corals are obviously a habitat for lots of other marine animals as well. So lots of different things that are going into this and are definitely affecting places like islands, like Hawaii. Um, and all over the world, especially where, you know, you're closer to sea level. This is just the result of another climate assessment. Um, again, there's lots of different models you can look at if you're really interested. And it, it all does sound like doom and gloom. And there is a lot of that. But there are things we can be doing and things that we can be pushing for or pushing corporations towards as well. But it, it is going to take some work and it's going to take a very collective effort. Okay. Um, again, not all of these species are negatively affected by climate change, but one species coping with it really well could mean that another one is going to do even more poorly because let's say um, you have one species doing really well, but that's a predator for another species, then we're going to completely knock out the other species. Okay. And as we were talking about um, this thing called Arctic amplification, so this is the the melting of Arctic Arctic sea ice, basically. And you can see the Arctic has warmed twice as much as the rest of the planet. Why is that happening? Well, sea ice is actually reflecting a lot of that sun, right? 
So the less and less sea ice you get, the more and more warm it's going to get. So that's happening much quicker than it ever did before. And you can even see the extent uh, of sea ice. In 2019, here's where the sea ice is. 1981 to 2010, the average minimum extent when it was completely frozen was all the way out here. So we've already seen sea, sea level rise. We're already seeing quite a big decrease in sea ice. That's a problem. It's exposing even more of the ocean um, to global warming. It's increasing temperatures and it's making it happen a lot faster in the Arctic, which is why species like our polar bears, which are so lovable, look at how cute they are, are in a lot of trouble, right? They, on average, are weighing 55 pounds less than they did 30 years ago. It's compromising their reproductive ability. It's compromising their ability to find food. Um, and we're, we're seeing a huge problem with this, right, especially in the Arctic. The other issue that you have is that climate change poses different public health risks. And I think this is actually how your book starts off, is it starts off with um, an example of, I think in Norway, I gotta look. Um, I think in Norway, when something melted, actually I lied, I think it's Siberia. Um, but in Siberia, you had, um, I think this was in 2016, the the ice melted and you had these reindeer that had been infected with anthrax basically or with the bacteria that causes anthrax and it caused a huge issue because of this un, unusually warm weather that happened in that region it melted all of their frozen tombs and it released the microbe into the town and then they had an anthrax outbreak in this town so we can see very similar things happening um for instance with like lyme disease Increased air temperature um, is causing the bacterium that causes Lyme disease to be transmitted. Um, sorry, it's transmitted through, you know, like deer ticks. Um, but because the increase in global temperature, deer tick populations have increased. They've gone into new territories. Um, they're far more prevalent than they used to be. So we're also going to see an increase in Lyme disease. Increase in water temperatures also has an effect on different bacteria that live in the water that are flesh eating, like Vibrio vulnificus. Um, it's transmitted by contact with contaminated shellfish like oysters. And if we have an increase in global water temperatures, we're also going to see these Vibrio infections increasing as well and becoming more frequent in different locations than they used to be. We're, we're starting to move more northwards as well as these oceans are warming. So. Quite, quite the public health risk when you're looking at um, different diseases, different bacteria, potentially viruses as well, that can now transmit through whether it's different species or whether the climate is making it more um, livable for them. So what can you do? How can you help? There's a lot of different things you can do, right? And um, you'll, you'll see this probably in your exam and some other places. Um, but there's, there's lots of things that you can do, like vote with your dollars, volunteer to help, do, do these service learnings and understand what they mean and maybe do them after this, this semester if, if that's what you're called to do. Um, if you watch something like Seaspiracy on Netflix, it's, they're basically going to try to convince you out of eating any seafood. And if, if you feel that way, that's great. And if you are like, I can never stop eating seafood. Don't worry about it. You can still eat seafood. Seafood is what sustained us, especially in Hawaii. It's a very sustainable source of food. But you have to choose which ones are are, are um, fished sustainably, which is hard to do. But in Hawaii, luckily, we have some pretty sustainable fisheries. Um, install lasting light bulbs. Turn off unnecessary lights. Protect natural ecosystems. Reduce wasted home electricity. Um, there's something called vampire energy. Even if you have things plugged in and you're not using them, they're still using electricity. It accounts for 5 to 8% of a single family's home electricity use. So if you have a fan that's not even turned on and you're not using it, unplug it. Um, those kind of things take up a lot. Okay. Eat less feed, feedlot beef. Um, try to reduce your meat consumption. Educate yourself. Educate others. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Lots of different things, right, that we can do, and um, it's it's all it's all helpful. And again, it, it 
does start with an individual, but we have a lot of corporate responsibility that needs to happen too. Okay, hopefully this wasn't <laughs> too depressing of a lecture on climate change, but please do good and remember that we, we can get through it. We just need to work together.